Blog Talk Radio. I'm Gabriel Rich. Be sure to tune in to The Rich Report Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. Each week, I'll explore topics and events that are relevant to the indigenous Negro Indian people and the communities we live in. It's all about living, learning, and thriving as we build both our physical and spiritual infrastructure through intellectual empowerment. This is a revolution of your mind. Get your mind together and get off white supremacy. It happens every Thursday. I hope you tune in. Let's get together and dialogue. Oh, now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Rich Report, sponsored by African Americans Ain't Africans, and broadcast live on blog, talk, radio, and stereo. Can't forget that part. Yo, tonight, we're going to explore tonight, right? We're going to get into DNA ties and the indigenous Americans, the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, I need that Clint Eastwood music right about now for that one. My guest is uh, Dr. Fatou, and she'll be on in just a few minutes, and we'll get down to the genetics of the matter, if you will, right? But first, really, really quickly, i got to hit the mailbag because, honestly, I owe it to all of you that hit me up with an email or an inbox because, again, I never saw this coming. When I, I put it out there like that, I thought maybe I'd get some strays, but, you know, good grief. You guys really hit me up, and I really appreciate it because I, I really wasn't expecting it. I'm still kind of humbled by it. It's kind of funny, too, however, but you Negroes, and you know the ones I'm talking about, okay, you upwardly bourgeois Negroes, I encourage you to hit me up whenever you feel like it. Send an email or, heck, heck fire. You can drop a, a line on Facebook or, you know, you can, you know, see me on Google+. Plus. I'm there often, or maybe LinkedIn if you're trying to, you know, dialogue with your fellow African-Americans, woo, 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 woo. I encourage you to hit me the fuck up because I just love it when you guys, you know, chime in with your thoughts of how we Negroes should think, feel, act according to how white people see us. I love to share it with my 4A audience. All you 4A people out there or, or within the sound of my voice, when you get a an email or you get a reply from a Negro like that, don't get mad. Don't. Get mad. Get even. Get even. Aha. 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 Get even. Right? You got to put them in their place. I love it. And it just also shows you really just how messed up we are as a people right now when you get those cats who are bold enough to do that. You know, uh, like the guy last week. I, boy. Whew. But anyway, yes, write again, dude, and feel free to. Plop it on my page. Obviously, you 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 know about what I'm doing. I don't know how you know. You could be an agent, a mole, whatever. Who cares? I don't give a shit anyway. All right? But feel free to jump on in there again. I'd love the good intellectual joust you bet your ass to gotcha. So, for you bourgeois Negroes, again, feel free. And, of course, all brothers and sisters, hit a brother. This one comes from CJ, who asks or says or Gabriel, I get where you're coming from about how white people treat us as opposed to how they treat Africans. I've seen it on both sides of the water. Have you ever dealt with a European who usually lives in Africa, and how did he treat you and yours? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that, CJ. I have. Actually, I've uh, seen, I, and I don't know if you guys have seen these Europeans or not. Maybe you have, or maybe you have. I'm sure some of you have, right, where they usually spend their time in Africa. That's their vacation spot, or even some of them live there, right? Some six months out of the year, and the other six months they live in their home country, whatever European home country that is, right? Okay, what they do uh, when they go over to Africa to spend time, they get all of their debauchery out, right? Every debauchery thing that you could think of, sadistic thing you can do, they take it out on the Africans. That's generally how they do in whatever African country that they're in. So a lot of them are, from what I've found, and I'm quite sure CJ can attest to this, they're disappointed when they come over here 
because they're expecting the same thing over here. They're expecting us to be docile. They expect that they could just, you know, grab a woman off the street, you know, uh, slap some dude who they disagree with or anything like that. They, all of that stuff, they expect that type of treatment, carte blanche treatment where we just, you know, just bow to them. And, of course, you and I know, fuck that. That doesn't happen here, right? So, yeah, I've, I've come across a, um, a few of them like that. This one cat, Belgian, uh, we were in a bar, and he was, you know, hey, you, 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 you're American black, yeah? You're different, yeah? You're different from African black, yeah? You talk too much, yeah? You, you fight back, yeah? Yeah, you, uh, you, 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 you're arrogant, yeah? Yes, you should be taught, yes? You should be, you should be bowing down to me right now, yeah? And, yeah. He got split open that night, and he, he never even saw it coming. He he felt that he could talk the same shit that he can talk over in South Africa, which is where he's, which is where he lives, and which is what they do. They run from him. They duck from him when he comes around. He he was bragging about that, and he expected us to do the same thing. That was also his first trip over, and it might have been his last because I don't know what happened to him, but I know that night some brothers split him wide the hell up open. So yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it, and again. Even he cited the difference between us, right? And even it's funny how your 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 subconscious remembers things that your conscious doesn't until you you maybe a situation comes back and it just it brings it back to you. He was talking about the difference between us. We can't be like them, you know. He, South Africa was the only obviously the only African country he'd gone through. He he made the rounds actually. He made the rounds in countries mainly for for sex you know, with the women, stuff like that. So he made the rounds. He was disappointed in how the women there, you know, he, he talked to an American black woman. She's American black. And she'd look at him like he, you know, like he shard his pants or something. Didn't want anything to do with him. That confused him. So, yeah, I've seen it, CJ. I find it pretty interesting, actually. And for anybody who's ever been in that situation, I'm quite sure if you look back on it, you find it pretty interesting, too. Okay. This last one is from Josh, who asks, Gabriel, you say you're in your 50s, right? Yes, I am, Josh. You also said at some point we're going to have to confront those younger brothers who are allowed to run things in our community. I'm in your age, age group, an ex-vet, and it seems like we 40s and 50s brothers are afraid of the young bucks. Why do you think that is? Well, Josh, I don't think that we are so much afraid of them as we are afraid of the outcome of dealing with them, and that's a problem. Okay, see, now bear with me, Josh. I'll, I'll be very brief. I think more than anything, we are afraid of the fact that we brothers who are in our 40s, 50s, even 60s, or obviously, you know, that they don't want any confrontation whatsoever. But keep in mind, a lot of those elderly cats will light your ass up with a, with a pistol shot if you confront them. They're not playing, all right? When I was in my 20s, Still used to avoid the cat who was all about trouble. I mean, we all did when we were kids. You didn't, we didn't call them thugs back then. They were hoodlums, and you didn't want to really deal with the hoodlums because the hoodlums were all about trouble. And the one thing you didn't want to get into was trouble, right? So when you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, you try to pretty much avoid a confrontation with cats like that until you can't avoid the confrontation. And it isn't because we were afraid of them. I was never afraid of any of these cats, never. But the whole point was I was afraid of prison. And I think that's it more than anything, Josh. A lot of us brothers just don't want to do time. See, because when a person does time, and in this case, let's say when a man does time, his whole family does time with him. His children do time with him. His woman does time with him. His mother, his parents, mother, father, they all do time with that person. They all do, right? If your woman goes to jail, you're doing time right along with her. So I never wanted to be taken off the streets for having to light up some cat over some stupidity, really. So it's not being afraid of them. And I get that you're ex-military. I'm not. My brother's ex-military, and I can tell you right now, he damn sure ain't afraid of them. But he don't want to do no time either. Most of the cats I know, just the average brothers who are going through their day trying to, you know, trying to, to, to handle their biz like everybody else, they got responsibilities, and those responsibilities trump having to stomp the guts out of some, you know, some young buck who's, you know, yoking up at him, thinking that they, you know, they they this, that, and the third. That's really it more than anything. But I do agree with you 
Josh, that we got to stand up to these cats at some point because, truth be told, a lot of these young bucks think we're afraid of them and they think that we can't handle them. Let me be really clear to you young bucks living that lifestyle and thinking that you could come up on a 50-something, and particularly if he's in shape, you can see he's in shape, takes care of his body, the whole nine, he will probably beat your motherfucking brakes off in a one-on-one fight. And some of you young bucks are good with your hands. Some of you are. Some of you fight all the fucking time. So I know you're good with your hands. You can throw them things. But don't mistake. Don't mistake for one fucking second. A 50-something out here who done been through the wars like you have, he ain't got to fight every day. Shit, most smart, intelligent people don't fight every fucking day. So that's nothing. Don't think for one second that you got a one-up on him because you like the fight. Don't think that for, for one second. I'm not about to get out here and struggle with any motherfucker out here like I'm in a, in a WWE match. Bruh, I'm going to kick your fucking knee in. I'm going to pull your balls down to the ground if I can, all right? And I'm going to choke you out until your face turns white. That's simple as that. I got three good shots in me. Really, more, but three good ones. I ain't trying to get out and struggle, which I already said that, right? And if I can't beat you, I'll probably shoot you. It's that simple. I'll probably shoot you. I'll, I'll just shoot you. I don't have to kill you. I can just shoot you. If I, if I shoot you in the right place, you'll back the fuck up. And that's, even if that's a pinky shot, you'll back the fuck up because most people ain't used to being shot. So it's as simple as that. There are cats, when we were kids, there were cats in our neighborhood, right? There were cats in our neighborhood, older guys, when we were kids. They would say the middle-aged and older men who you knew not to mess with them because they'd pop a cap in your ass yesterday. They were not to be trifled with. Well, ironically, myself, my brother, and a lot of the cats I grew up with, we're not those old men or older men, we're now them. We don't want to bother anybody, but God forbid, you know, if I got to do jail, I'm going to make your motherfucking ass work. So it's as simple as that, Josh. It's not fear. It's just fear of prison. It's fear of being away from your loved ones. It's fear of living, you know, in a cell. It's fear of of, uh, being taken off the street where you can't do any good and help anyone. Now, People are helping you. I think that's it more than anything. But I do get what you're saying, and I knew, you know, we do need to mobilize. We do need to go ahead and start pimp slapping the shit out of these young bucks because, quite frankly, they're asking for it. They're just begging to be made an example of some of them, not all of you. Now, a lot of these young cats are cool as fuck. I know a lot of you cats, so I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about the cat who ain't got his head on straight, who's getting out here trying to use his physical influence to intimidate people, you know, the whole nine. I never like bullies. So, that's pretty much it, Josh. Oh, and really quickly, we got Dr. Patu coming on in a couple of minutes, so I, I want to bring something up real quickly, something that happened to me today, right? I was in Cary, North Carolina. So anybody who knows anything about Cary, North Carolina, Cary is, um, let's just say it's kind of like the heart of Research Triangle Park. Research Triangle Park is is the 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 East Coast version of the Silicon Valley, right? So the average income in Cary, on average now, is about one hundred and five, one hundred and ten thousand a year. So this is where a lot of your your corporate CEOs live. It was once a town that was founded on the backs of Negro Indians. That is now almost lily white. They've they've pushed those people uh, further into either Durham or Raleigh, right? So okay, I was in Cary today. I'm driving along in my uh, hoopty, and it is a hoopty. It was a ninety-five. Uh, 95 Mitsubishi Mirage family car. Been in the family for 22 years, and I was driving it today, right? So it's got good gas mileage, by the way. That's why I like to drive it. But anyway, I'm driving my hoopty today, and I make a right turn on a yellow light. And this cop, who is a car and a half behind me, ducks the other car, makes a, you know, jumps, sidesteps the other car, makes a point to pull me over. Okay, he pulls me over. Obviously, my tags and the whole now he had to do that, so he know I had no nothing on me, right? He gets out of the car with the gun drawn already. Let me repeat that. He got out the car and he already had his gun drawn. So he's got the gun walking towards me in his right hand, and I'm bugging out, thinking, you know, I can't. I'm not bugging out because I'm scared. Because that's what they expect you to be. 
there have been a lot of brothers who have been killed because they were scared. If you're scared, you're practically, I'll just repeat, you're just begging to be killed. Don't ever be scared because they're emboldened by your fear. I'm bugging out because this cat's got a gun in his hand walking up to the car, right? Okay, and before he even asked me for my license, registration, he <clears throat> says, don't make me in fear of my life. And I'm thinking, what? You got a gun in my face and you in fear of your life, right? So then we go on to do the dance of, did you know that, you know, I felt that you didn't, basically, long story short, I felt that you didn't yield enough on this, on this light, on this one you made before you made a turn. It's a yellow light. I don't have to necessarily yield. If nothing's coming, I can turn. Nothing was coming. I turned, right? Okay, so I'm asking him, why does he have his weapon out? I don't have a weapon, and you're afraid, you're in fear of your life, and you got a weapon out, and you got it pointed at me. And he kept saying the same thing. Look, sir, don't make me in fear of my life here. You know, I'm just asking you some questions, which he, he didn't really ask me any questions other than, you know, uh, did I see the light was yellow. Other than that, he didn't ask me any questions. Basically, he wanted to fuck with me, Right? Now, I can say without a doubt, if I had been afraid, nervous, shaky, if I had been hesitant, trembling, he would have pulled me out of that car because he asked me to get out, and I wouldn't. I told him, I'm not getting out. You haven't even given me a reason for stopping me. I'm not getting out. And he was thrown off by the fact that I wasn't afraid of him. Now, look, you can gauge people, all right, and I could gauge that this cat wasn't the – he was more Barney Fife than he was, let's say, Killer Cop X or, you know – Killer Carl or some shit like that. He wasn't that dude, uh, but you know, I could gauge that. But even if it was Killer Carl X, and I have come across one of those cats too, I'm not afraid of them. See, they're emboldened by our fear. They like it when we are afraid because here's the thing: since the cop explosion with a cop hire was the military industrial complex has gone, you know, to uh, the police now. You got a lot of bitch-ass, pussy-ass cops out here. You got a lot of cops out here that were pushed around when they were kids, that were mistreated, abused, and the whole nine, and they feel like they can get even by wearing a badge. They get their boldness from wearing a badge. They get their, you know, they get their courage from wearing a badge. You even got a lot of them out here that got popcorn muscles, work out every day, you know, the whole nine, so that they can look the part like the cat who slammed a girl down in South Carolina that time, you know, on steroids the whole night. But he's still a pussy, right? Because he won't do that to everybody. He did it to a girl, all right? So that was that cop. And that, trust me, I'm not a big dude. Like I said, I don't walk through doors sideways, no shit like that. I'm 5'8", 225, and that's not all fat, ladies, just <laughs> so you know. Hey, hey, hey. But... <laughs> I mean, I, I ain't a big dude. I'm just saying, Buck. I ain't a big dude, Buck. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, <laughs> so it's not like I'm, I'm, I'm that intimidating from you just, you know, from you pulling me over. I don't have a bag of, you know, I don't have a bag of a pound of Colombian Bam Bam in the trunk. I'm not out here flipping birds. I'm not here doing any of that shit. The worst thing you can say I ever did <clears throat> was get a speeding ticket. You know, didn't pay my court fee, some shit like that. But it could have been really sideways today, and I'll do seriousness. It could have been sideways. It really went sideways today if I was afraid of him because he was looking for me to be afraid of him because, one, I was in Cary, and they feel that Cary now is their time, their town. Carrie uh, is also home to a lot of Indians there, as in Indians, as in Hindustanian who are there living there big time. They're there big time now. And they even have a certain section to themselves, but they don't get that type of harassing treatment because they have an economic, one, they know who they are, and two, they have an economic clout. Uh, a singular brother in Carrie, yeah, they're going to fuck with him. I don't care if you're driving my little hookah that I was driving today or if I'm driving a Lexus like I like I do. So, yeah, don't matter. So I just had to I had to get that off my chest today because, quite frankly, if 
I wanted to slam that cop to hell. I mean, I wanted to slam the slam it through the concrete where he just went straight down to hell for it. But the reality is he's got the gun and I don't. And truthfully, I was slipping. I should have had a piece. I'm slipping. You're right, Amp. You're right, brother. I'm slipping. So, yeah, that's that. But anyway, without further delay, I wanted to get back to the show because, again, we are going to get into DNA blood ties and the indigenous American, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Woo! Wah, wah, wah. Got to add your own when you ain't got the track, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> my guest tonight is Dr. Fatu. Hi, Dr. Fatu. How you doing? I'm fine. Hello? I'm here. Okay, there you go. There you okay. go. How you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm a little see, under the I weather, took... so if my you know, if you hear me occasionally coughing, pardon it's me. Okay. It's okay. It's quite all right. I understand. I'm under the weather too today. So you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, I, I hear. Yeah, I got PTSD right now. Right. Yeah, I'm I know. Go ballistic. <laughs> no. oh, <okay>. So, <laughs> but you know, you and I, we talked about this. We've been talking about this uh, particular show, particularly the last week, but even longer mm-hmm. than that, because you've been into diving into DNA since um, our last show, the show that you were guest on, when we were talking about the dental records and things of that nature. But now oh, you're yeah. taking it really a step further. I don't know if anybody has read Fatou's post, but you should, you know. And, and she, it, she it posted the to, same it thing. It helps to definitely read it because I'm basically yeah. following the outline. I, I'll i mention some things uh, in the interview uh, in the program that I didn't even mention uh, in my write-up. I tried not to make the write-up too long, but uh, basically I'm following that. And I just posted something actually on your um, your thread there. I'm going to refer yeah. to it. it. It's basically like a chromosomal painting from 23 cool. and me. That's my uncle's, I, I, and yeah, it's I going it. to uh, be related to what we'll be discussing. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, now, like you said, there's been a, a – a DNA kind of like this, this, it's been an explosion, so to speak, right? It's been this boom of people who are trying to find their ancestry through DNA. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. Now, I was always hesitant and skeptical about it, first off. Even right. when I was into the whole, you know, even when I was into the whole, you know, pro-black, you know, all that other shit, I was still skeptical because DNA is a whole other groove, man, and I don't want to give any of mine unless I absolutely have to. But um, since people are doing it, oh, and I, I got to ask you, did you ever see the DNA? Was it the Ancestry.com is the sister who um, they tell her that she is, what, 70% or something West African? So she's putting on the African outfit with the hat and she's crying you know, saying that this is important because I finally know who I am. Did you ever see that commercial? I never. Did you, you ever see that? <laughs> no, I never saw that. I never saw that, that commercial. That's just to be a, I, please, She's an actress. <laughs> she's an actress, but she ought to be ashamed of it. She know damn well her name is probably Minerva, and she's from Cleveland. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, but what I'm trying to understand is who's still using uh, African ancestry because uh, didn't Rick Kittles actually, I mean, I don't need to ask this. I'm being rhetorical. I mean, Rick Kittles actually <laughs> said straight up, on, in an interview that we basically just assign, you know, because people feel good to be attached to tribes. I mean, he just outright said they just arbitrarily assign these <laughs> tribes. I mean, you know, I, I mean, who is still ordering from this company? You'd be uh, surprised. You know, they be need surprised. to see that video. Because, I mean, because he just he admits it. <laughs> you got to see that video. You got to see that video, man. She looked like she should have a, a church fan or a Martin Luther King church fan on her hand, and she should be at the front of the at the front of the front row, you know, on Sunday at church. That's what she looked like. But now she's putting on this African outfit, this Nigerian outfit, and the whole night. And she's putting the hat on and she's crying, saying it's such a mm-hmm. big moment. I posted it uh, in four eggs sometime back because it's just hilariously stupid. But well, it is, you know. <laughs> But this is how it's got us, though, isn't it? This, isn't this how DNA has us? It has us even more confused 
uh, than, you know, we were before, uh, you know, the whole DNA, um, the DNA testing, correct? Uh, yes, but um, you made a statement on your thread, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. You mentioned okay. that even though tensions was to use this to further confuse us and further mm-hmm. remove us from our indigenous heritage, in the process, if you have some basic understanding of genetics, blood ties, your history, you will see that they actually end up proving that you're indigenous. Yes. They yes. actually end There's... up proving that you're indigenous. And and a lot of stuff has been uncovered because of this. Because of this DNA stuff, a lot of stuff, the truth about a lot of stuff has been uncovered. It can actually even be they they've actually given people like me more credence. <laughs> they, that's that's all they've done. The only thing what the only thing they're saying is that you're sub Saharan African. That's the only thing they're saying. But everything around them links you to this land and we'll we'll talk about that. Good. And and I agree. And like I was saying and, and you know, we were talking about a lot of the times, see, they, the thing is with them, with the whole DNA thing is, sure, it's a lie, but the deal with Wasichus is they put a lot of their lies enveloped in truth, right? Mm-hmm. The lie, there's truth in the middle, and they envelop the lie around the truth. That's why it carries so much weight, and that's why we fall under its spell. See, spells don't generally work unless they have some degree of measure uh, that people can identify with, and then you put the spell around that measurement. Right, and then you cast it out to people. And casting it out, it means as in like broad cast. That's all it is. You're just casting a spell broadly to a broad mm-hmm. audience. That's what broadcast right. means. So that's that's what they do. So um, I had a friend of mine who um, she is actually similar uh, to you, Doctor Fatu. Is in her uh, she is Ghanaian father. Right, and mm-hmm. her um, mother is from Wilson, North Carolina. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you know, and um, she cites the differences as well, you know, uh, in, in between the two. But even she digs deeper than most, and she will say to the utmost degree that the DNA testing is a hoax. At first, she used to say that, and then she used, she came back and said it's a hoax, but there's truth in the hoax. Right. Meaning the same thing that what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so you're right. When do you find out that you're two percent Cherokee or you're three percent or nine percent or now they say they they actually do break it down, but now they they'll say that you're say overall you're fourteen percent indigenous American. They're telling you you're an indigenous American. That's really what they're doing, people. Exactly. That's really exactly. That's what they're doing. So, okay. Now we since we gotten down to basically the scratch the surface, Doctor Fatu, mm-hmm. I want you to pretty much explain to people the differences that you know you've seen in terms of let's let's talk about the good first, right? Let's talk about okay. the good since we've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll save the ugly for last, so it'll be <laughs> on people's minds and they'll sleep on it. You know what I'm saying? And they'll be rolling in bed <laughs> thinking about all that ugly DNA. No. <laughs> a friend of mine told me he, he, he didn't have time to read all of the stuff I wrote, so he jumped straight to the to the ugly. He went straight to the ugly, huh? He went straight to the ugly. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. He didn't want to read about the good. No, he said or he the bad. to the ugly. Just the ugly. Mm-hmm. Clint Eastwood right, somewhere and rolling good. over in his grave. So what now? Yeah, we'll talk about the good. Um, The good basically is, yes, the good is what we're saying now, okay? The good is what we're saying now, that basically even though the intention of these DNA tests is to further confuse us and to further link us to the African continent and remove our minds and uh, any connection that we have to this land, in the process of doing the DNA test, what you end up uh, discovering is that you're related to people who belong to uh, the state recognized tribes. Now, before I, I even mention that, prior to doing these DNA tests, and I, I did the test on my mother before she passed, 
Um, she passed recently, but I did this test on her uh, a few years ago. So that means that now I have accumulated a lot of relatives, you know, o- you know, over th- thousand re- relatives. Okay, and uh, also I I took a very extensive family history, you know, and I mentioned this before. I've been researching my family history since I was age 19, and I right. spoke to a lot of the elders, so I have a vantage point that I had names. I am fully aware that many of the uh, uh, free people of color who are actually uh, tribal members, they had certain types of names as well. If you hear the surnames, they are linked to uh, tribes. So if you hear names, you'll know, okay, it's most likely associated with this tribe and that tribe and that tribe. So I I have that kind of advantage because I'm familiar with last names, surnames, and the families and the links and the tribes that belong uh, to those nations. So now I'm having that kind of background and I do this kind of test. And what uh, is being revealed, okay, so fine, I get these percentages on my uncle. I did it on my mom's brother. It's a full brother. And I did it on my mother, and they have X number, you know, 70 whatever percent African. And then you have European. And my mom and my uncle came out with 0% uh, Native American, okay? So, but in the meantime, I'm matching to a whole lot of people, okay? And I also get to look at their percentages as well, which I've been always doing. And one of the things that I found very interesting, number one, one was I noticed that number one you're going to have white relatives as well you will and mm-hmm. you, you will end up matching to Caucasian people as well so yes. now my relatives are what we call black and white so now I'm looking at everybody's results and I'm looking uh, down at their breakdown and one of the first things that I noticed was that when anyone did test positive for Native American for the most part it was us and it was yeah. common for us to test positive for Native American. The thing is, the Native American would be regarded as, oh, these are small amounts, small but statistically significant, but very tiny amounts. It could be 1%, it could be uh, 1.2%. Whatever it is, it's small but nevertheless statistically significant. But what I was noticing is that even though that's mongoloid DNA, nevertheless, it was present. It, it is present among so-called African Americans. I mean, the, right. you know, a good portion of us are not even zero. We are still showing it. And my white relatives, very, it's very rare for me to find them with the Native American. That's the first thing I noticed. Okay. Now, the other thing that I took note of, now I'm familiar with names uh, because I uh, did my family history. I'm also familiar with some of the tribal members as well, people who belong to some of these nations. They're also matching to my mom, and they're also matching to my uncle. So okay. we can see there's a connection, there's a connection there as, as, as well. Okay, nobody that's continental African is matching. I'm just, that's a side note occurred to me to do myself um, because I felt like I already know my father's lineage. What is there to know? He's 100% African. It's, you know, it's going to come up 99.5. That's usually the results that come up, especially for West African, 99.5, 99.8, right. or 100%. So what is there to know? And then right. a friend of mine told me, you know what, you, you should do it. You should do your DNA because... If you do your DNA, it'll give you a basis of comparison. So, you know, I decided to do it, all right? And um, I was actually shocked. Um, and the reason why I was shocked would be because my father is 100% uh, West African. You would think anything that was not quote-unquote African, okay, would be gone pretty much by the time it reaches me. It was not. I actually had more Native American DNA than my uncle, who's a full-blooded indigenous American, okay? So I have to give a lot of credit to Tyrone Lewis Cannon of the Genetic and Trust Group because I learned a lot from him. And Mm -hmm. also I did a lot of reading uh, from other geneticists when they break down and they look at the chromosomal painting. And I actually posted it up. Here on your uh, thread, let me go I to see. it. Okay, I, I said see. my uncles. I want to refer to that, and I want to go to okay. it for a minute. Okay. Sure. All righty, there's my uncles. Okay, and I'm going to click on that. If you look, you see his X chromosome there? Yes. At the bottom? 
and you see yes. that little uh, that yellow strip? Yes. Okay, that yellow represents Southeast Asian. That's the color that they assign, uh, assign to Southeast Asian uh, DNA. Okay, and what and that that uh, large it's um, maroon looking color strip that represents Sub-Saharan African DNA, which they they will not distinguish from Paleo American. But we do right. know that it is Paleo American because my my uncle is is, is a full blood from here. He's not half African. All right. Black now, foot? when you see a when you see a small he strip a like foot? this, my my it's, family it's... does not know. Their their tribes. I figured it out through tracing it, so I can and I'm gonna get to that as well. Okay. Yeah, but, it, yeah, we, we say, talked about this, and it they seem like they there's some Blackfoot there, eastern North Carolina. Probably, uh, but oh, yeah, probably they were in the area, and I'm going to I'm going to get to that as well because those are the other good aspects of these tests. I mean, aside from the fact that we don't know what they're doing with the DNA, for, you know, I know about all of that, but I already right. submitted it. So whatever the government is going to do to me, they already planted it. Okay, so yeah, let's forget about yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> all righty. All right, so when you see a strip like that, a tiny strip from another nation, another genetic marker mixed into a dominant strip like this one on this X chromosome, according to geneticists, and what I've been taught is that that tells you that that intermixing took place between these two populations a very long time right. ago. Right. If that had been a larger strip, then it would suggest that's more recent at mixture, like a grandparent or something like that, okay, or mm. even a great. A tiny strip like that, let me see. I took a – let me see if I – I didn't post another picture. But you will see if you – if I would uh, send a picture of all his chromosomes, you'll see chromosome 1 and 2, you'll see the tiny markers of Southeast Asian embedded. And you will always notice it is adjacent to the – purple strip, which is labeled right. Sub-Saharan African, which we now know right. is paleo. We know that's paleo. And what does that tell us? That, that those Southeast Asian markers intermixed with the paleo generations in ancient times. That is an ancient yes. mix. Okay? Now, yes. when you look at basically African, so-called African Americans, when you look at their patterns, one of the things that you'll notice is this is common. It is a rare African American that will not have that. It may turn out to be zero if they uh, test with uh, ancestry DNA. And the reason why ancestry DNA marks it as, as zero is because ancestry DNA marks anything that is under 1% as zero, but it doesn't mean it's zero, and it doesn't mean it's statistically insignificant. Do you understand that? I do. That's just 23, I mean, that's just ancestry DNA. If you test with 23andMe, 23andMe will acknowledge the percentages under 1%, right. and it will be statistically significant. Now, why is that important? Because we're not Mongoloid, we're not Southeast Asian. The reason why is because if a population where the majority of those people are showing these type of patterns, like here what's on my uncle's X chromosome, right. if that's what you're seeing with the majority of them, then you have to say, well, when did this, how can this be when according to United States history, let's pretend we, are, we don't know better. We really believe we came here on a boat and we came here during the enslaving uh, process when importation uh, happened. Let's, let's say we really believe, we really believe roots happen. Well, right. according to United okay. States history, importation really came in bulk after 1750. Now, that's exactly. documented. That is clearly documented. So, therefore, if we are the children of people that were imported, that means any kind of uh, Native American or anything that's outside of African DNA should be washed out five generations or more, and that is according to geneticists. Yes, So, true. if you had, for example, let's say, I'm African, okay? I'm African, and I had a distant 
uh, great whatever Chinese great 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 grandmother. Okay, so that's a totally different group genetically. If she is five generations or more from me, by the time it reaches me, they would read zero. They will no longer be able to read it. That's according to them. Well, how is it that the majority of uh, African Americans, uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of us, are showing these little tiny bands of Southeast Asian and or Native American DNA? How is that? And you will see that those tiny bands are adjacent to this so-called African DNA, which means that those were two populations that intermixed. How is it yes. that we are African, but that is not being uh, mixed out of us by now? Makes 1750, you wonder, inter- importation was banned 1808. Granted, there 1808. was some, a little bit of legal uh, smuggling, but even according to history, 1786, importation actually stopped, except for Georgia. Well, That's even in legal, even in. Even illegally, after about 1825 or so, it it, it already had been petered out. 1833 yeah. actually is marks the date where the, it had literally just been it came to a halt. So you, even then, you still only talked about a period of what, you know, a little over 80 years. Yes, it's not even a hundred years. So not that is why years. I no. will say in my writings, uh, 285 to 388,000. I'm just quoting what. They say, and that's still a small number when you're talking about populations, but I don't even believe that number because their their dates couldn't account for that. Their dates, United States history dates of importation and when they actually outlawed it. And let's not forget what Benjamin Franklin said. Benjamin Franklin said in 1751, why increase the sons of Africa here? Remember? Yeah. Yes, he did. Why would he say that? He, he he said that because there were people, there were plenty of slaves already here. Yeah, there were already slaves there. Why increase? If any, Why he increase also the said that, Africa over here? That's that's yeah. what he said because there were already people of color already here. Yeah. And he there also was no said need to. stop. He also said stop sending all of these prostitutes over here, these vagrants okay. and prostitutes over here fucking up our country. Yeah, he was he didn't just he it wasn't just against it wasn't just against uh the sons of Africa. He had issues with really pretty much uh, he was really pretty much against immigrants also. So he was, he was like, yeah, he was he was a he was a classist, but he he also understood that by that time <clears throat> they needed to close the cap, so to speak, in terms of sending all of your wretched refuge uh yes. over to America. Start sending some respectable white folks is what he was saying. You know, I'm tired of all these prostitutes, these pickpockets, these, you know, this and that, because, uh, one, they were illiterate, and they had to be trained. And he got, he and, and, and those of his ilk were sick of training them, were sick of actually being responsible for training them, because, truth be told, they were far, far less intelligent than the people of color who were already here, us. Right. He couldn't learn anything from them. He couldn't learn anything from them at all. They were, they were, they were literally, you know, they were illiterate. Yeah, he got tired of them too. So, but yeah, you're right. He did say that, and I wonder how many people took notice of, it, or, or you know, now that we're older, we can read between the lines of a lot of the stuff that has been said, and we can see the common thread. Okay, it's 9:43. People, I am on with Doctor for two, and we are talking about DNA testing, right? The good, the bad, yeah. and the ugly. When it comes to us, indigenous Negro Indians. So feel free to call in. Uh, 563-999-3442 is the number. Press 1 if you have a question or comment. And we are going to get back into it because this is damn interesting. As I knew it would be because Dr. Patu is that, that system. So, Dr. Patu, let me ask you. I'm, yes. I'm just going to say for two. Okay, because uh-huh. I think we know each other well enough that I can say for two, for two. <laughs> I'm, just, Go ahead. I'm just messing. Okay, but okay, um, the whole deal of with okay with mongoloids is because a lot of us don't. Okay, yourself, Tasha C. She's she's a proponent of because we're you know she's all about what the evidence leads you to, what the evidence leads you, right? And quite a few others know that obviously there's some mongoloid DNA that exists in us. And we, you know, 
been talking about this for a minute, right? But some people will confuse that as saying that maybe they are the real Native Americans. I've gotten that actually in the last week since I started right. talking about this, you know. So could you set the record straight on that? Who was here okay. first? <clears throat> Evidently, we were here first. There's a there's a um, a DNA term. It's called genetic introgression. Okay, DNA introgression. Now, I, it's a very complex um, subject, and I'm oversimplifying it. But when you look at that DNA that I uh, posted there with the right. yellow that band of my uncles, that's that process. And, that's how it was explained and anybody, to me. And anybody, please go to my page, right, the post that I made about the show. Uh, Fatou is, is posting all this DNA info, so feel free to take a look at it. You know, And if you're not my FB friend, then you need to be my FB friend so we can check it out. You know what I'm saying? We can check it out and talk about it. But, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, oh wait no, a minute. Real okay. quickly, real quickly, Dr. Fatou, we got 317 on the line. 317, you're on the Rich Report. What's up? Oh, Theo, to lead you. Hello. That's uh, hello in Cherokee. How are you? Um, yes. I have a question. Um, when I took a DNA test, because uh, I'm a mixture of uh, Black Native American and Mexican Native American, um, okay. the test was for like my daughter to verify that um, she was my daughter. And one of the race, they said from a Black group. They didn't say African. They said a Black group. Is that kind of showing that I'm indigenous to America and not to Africa? When this is a Black group, hey, or, Hmm. For two? No, I don't repeat the question again. Okay, I uh, I know oral history that I'm a Salagi, Cherokee, and De yeah. Apache, and a Chicano, Mexican American. My mm -hmm. mom and my dad's side. I took a DNA test for the state of Indiana to do DNA, um, you know, paternity to find out was my daughter my daughter, and they also included race. And under that race, they said a black. Group. It didn't say African. It said a black group. Now, were they saying that I'm indigenous to America with the black group, or was that just trying to put me under African? Can you break that down? They were to being me? not. They were being very nonspecific because they're not making a distinction between sub-Saharan African DNA and Paleo. They are deliberately not. Now, what I was be, what I was told by Tyrone Lewis Cannon that you know there are people far more well versed in, in that area in terms of knowing the distinction between Paleo American, which would be uh, people here, people such as yourself, and Sub-Saharan African. That what they're basing this on is something called ancestral informative markers, and that has to that's what. That's the commonality between people here and continental Africans. But other than that, I really can't explain to you how they are different, but evidently they are different. They are, mm -hmm. they are clearly different because the populations do not look the same. And we do know mm -hmm. that there are people uh, from East Coasting tribes who belong to these tribes who've participated in these DNA tests, and they get the same results, the sub-Saharan mm -hmm. African. And you can see that their skeletal features, their facial features, it's not the same as continental Africans. Right, that's what I like. A lot of black right. men say say we're not the same as Africans. We don't look, eat, or even think the same as them. And a lot of times I think about it. All the time they tell us that you know our grandmothers tell us we're indigenous to the United States. They never claim African. Right. I'm gonna ask on the uh, Mexican side because I know that they are also of uh, Paleo Indian. You know the the old yes, the old are. tech. The, the the Toltec and the um, Aztec. So if I took oh. that test, would I see su a lot of Sub-Saharan African, or what? What would I see more of? With the Mexican, it's a little it's harder. You probably going to see a little bit more of a Mongoloid mix. Mongoloid, In Mexico yeah. was hard. It's hard to avoid it because uh, they just have more Mongoloid there. You understand? Mm. Okay. Now, well, the, that won't ass assist me in any tribal enrollment, would it? At all. I'm sorry, even though, the question? That wouldn't help me with any uh, tribal enrollment, would it? Even though I have mm -hmm. those uh, DNA, that doesn't count, right? You know, Unless a lot of... the Navajo uh, Nation. You know what? That would depend on the uh, individual tribes. I, You know, I'm going to actually talk about that later on when yes. we get to the ugly truth. Because yes. uh, there's a lot of gatekeeping 
with at least the tribes that I'm familiar with here on the East Coast, there's a lot of gatekeeping mm-hmm. and a lot of elitism, and they they you know well they can tell you that DNA test uh, is not enough, you know, but mm-hmm. uh, it's a lot of gatekeeping in terms of who's who and gets into these uh, tribes, particularly here on the East Coast with some of the state recognized tribes. What I find is like with the old, mm-hmm. with the five solar tri- tribe, the ones that's the whitest of the white, they're the ones, the gatekeepers and the, the full mm-hmm. bloods. They're either at the bottom or they're not even enrolled. They don't. That's what I find out a lot of times. Or they they don't get no health care a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And you'll groups. find that it's the same process on the East Coast. You'll see that it's the mulatto element that's uh, exactly. gatekeeping. And a lot of that, we'll, we'll get into that. I don't want to put the oh, good night, y'all. anything before it. <laughs> she don't want to put okay. the cart before the horse, but, yeah, you, exactly. she's right about that. Yeah, I, I, you know, I I see it here with the, the Waccamaw, with the Lumbee, and a few other tribes that are here as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, she'll, she'll get into that, bro. She'll, she'll okay, into, so she'll, we'll get into that with the ugly side. Okay, I'm gonna tell you guys, wado adona dagi. That means um, thank you until we meet it again. Okay, you're very welcome. All right, much thanks, brother. Uh, my name is uh, Carlton Walker, and I Carlton? have a yeah, I have What's a group that's called uh, Black Native Americans of the Southeast. I post information, and then I came across you two, African Americans ain't African. I right. came across that page. So, yes, it's nice to talking to you. Take care. Okay, take care. All right. Right on, bro. Feel, and feel free to tune in, you know, anytime, man, and call back. We appreciate you. Okay, for two, we have yes. 267 on the line. 267, you're on the Rich Report. What's up, 267? Okay, we'll get back to 267. We have 813 on the line. 813, you're on the Rich Report. What's up? Hello? Okay, is this mic on? Is this on? Hello? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. What's up, bro? You okay, there? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. What's going on, brother? Oh, hey, peace. I'm sorry. What's going on, Rich? Rich, this is What's Tavis. happening, How bro? You no, much, much. Hey, you, you, you still, I'm glad you're still alive. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? I actually, I, I am alive, and you know what? I actually had a passing in my family, my grandmother. Oh, so we kind of went off cue for a little while. But thank you very much. Right on. But right on. just a good online, I just wanted to say one thing. They're going to find whatever they're looking for, and they're definitely not looking for us. And so any of us that goes to any of their information, whether it be science, whether it be history, whether it be just social consciousness, is not built for us. They're never going to share our Stuff as a part of their science is going to be up. It's going. It's up to us. From my perspective, it's up to us to do things like what you are doing today to bring the conversation that has intellectuals start those institutions <clears throat> to provide us with as what they would consider alternative information, or information based right on our history, our stance versus what they kick. But my, right. pro- I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say, right, is that. Everybody in the world thinks their people are the best people, which is great. You know, are we think we're the best Asians, and, you know, they think they're the best Australians, think they're the, and everybody good at what they do. But I think our problem is, is that we look at their stuff too much to validate who we are. It's like we need them to say that this is what it is in order for it to be right within us. And True. a lot of that testing... You know, a lot of the questions are centered around that because we grew up like that. So I just like yes. to put a conundrum out there for everybody to really consider this. If if I know that, if my mama told me that, if me and my man can sit down or me and my girlfriend can sit down and talk about this, why do we care if anybody else is saying this? You know, I agree. for instance, the five-dollar Indian stuff, and everything is centered around this DNA thing, but if... Uh, you saw my mother's show before we talked about it. It's the same thing from 1600. It's just a new yes. way to propagate this one drop rule. Yes. Because the African I, is there. Yeah. And, you know, for us to deny it would be for us to deny part of our history and part of who we are. But when we start saying $5 Indian, 
then and then and then they call us nigga kids. Well, who 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 better, me us or them? I'm gonna give you another example. For everybody out there calling everybody five dollar Indians, one of my sons has a BIA card. The other one don't. So, so all those five dollar Indians that y'all be calling, y'all talking about my grandma's son. I mean, my mother's son, my son. On the other hand, the other people on the other side that call my son nigga, oh, wait a second, I'm my son. So we have to understand that there's a family tie there, whether it's distant or it's right here in the present. And not to include them, but acknowledge that they carry traditions that we lost as a community. They got to hold on to. And not look at them as this they didn't do this to us. They got something done to them just like what we got done to us. Sure they so do. for us to you know, for us to discriminate against the people that's being discriminated as against us as much as we've been discriminated against. Maybe even more because we got less to deal with them. Honestly speaking, we got welfare. They don't. They got land that don't have, they can't even you no know, from got black farmers. We don't even buy from our black farmers. They got to sell white people. So, you know, as a part of the DNA and as a part of this conversation, we have to acknowledge a bigger reality that we got to mature. We got to step up. And when we see people disrespecting, whether it be on the streets, whether it be on our Facebook pages, whether it be in videos, whether it be in conversations, who who going to step up and start saying something about this? I just wanted to share Good that. Point. Thank you very Good point. much. It's all good, Tavis. Well, to be that was Red Tail Hawk, and to to be honest with you, uh, he's got a point. He's got a point in a lot of it. Although the African part is still minuscule, very, very, very minuscule. But yeah, I mean, um, it is min- hmm? it is minuscule. I mean, if we're going to mention the minuscule, then why not mention the Scottish? Why not mention the yes. the English? The, the I mean, English, we, the no, Irish. No group of people are, are defined by by it's it's not about uh, quantum. It's about what culture, it's uh, lines of inheritance and what culture you're identifying with. Right. It's it's no different than basically the the uh, the Siberians that you talk about. They have Mongoloid traits because they were they were overran by Genghis Khan. So right. that's why you have a lot of Siberians who basically have Asian traits. It's the same deal. Okay, we got 813 on the line. 813, you're on the Rich Report. Yeah, I just wanted to ask the doctor something, but I wanted to disagree okay. with the last caller. Um, I feel you on that. Native well, bro, no. bro, bro, real quick, uh-huh. I'm happy that you're alive because I know where you're in Florida. I got, I got Red Tail Hawk mixed <laughs> up with you. I'm just happy that yeah. you're alive, bro, that you won't hang it on like a palm tree with a belt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> Speaky cloud, bro. Go ahead. No, he, he, he red tail. He's more gangster than me, but I, I got to disagree on him about the Native American thing. They're getting reparations for a land that isn't theirs, but that's a different story. I was going to ask the doctor. I never did a DNA test, but I was going to ask about the gene- genealogy. I traced my roots back to the 1800s, and, mm-hmm. you know, we went from the Davis family to the Duke family in the 1800s, the early 1800s. I think, you know, he was born in Mississippi, and his wife was, and, you know, the children and stuff like that, and then it stops. I mean, where, where would I go? I don't know if you know about genealogy or anything like that. Where, where would I go after that, past the 1800s, the early 1800s, because they don't, they don't show none of that? You're saying like your family's not showing up on the records. Well, I mean, it it it, it shows like my grandmother where she was born and stuff like that, and then uh, her her father and her mother, well, my great great grandmother, and um, it, it showed he was born in Mississippi, and mm-hmm. um, his wife was born in Mississippi, <clears throat> but it doesn't go past that to his and her parents and stuff like that. I mean, where would you go after that because? Well, question: Do you have do you have the maiden names of your great your great great grandmothers? How far are you able to go back with their names? 
That's what I'm saying. I, I went back. Well, on the genealogy, I went back to the early 1800s. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I mean, it, is that how many work. of your lines you, you know, like for example, I I wasn't able to go back on all my lines because they simply weren't there. You understand? After um, before 1870, some of my relatives are just not there. Yeah, that's what I'm so talking about. Not, it's know, not, you... Yeah, it's not even even that. You know, some of us are just going to get stuck because some of us are just not documented before 1870. I've been able to do the greatest amount of research with the uh, side of my family that were free people of color because they were on the they were they were documented. So and Janet yeah, said were... Janet Warmwin said to to try to get death certificates as well. That'll help you. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that's what I was saying. I couldn't go past because he he was born like in the uh, 1820s. I didn't know if I go to like some type of Indian census or something like that to to go past. Now, the records before 1820 is is they they were not as detailed. Uh, okay. They start becoming more detailed after like 1850. To be honest with you. Even when you okay. speak to uh, people who do research and rec- they'll tell you that you'll look, you'll see, you won't see uh, the, uh, the you'll see the number of persons if they own slaves, the number of slaves. You don't really get too much information. Okay, I, I just didn't know if it was something to go past that, the you know Indian tribal affairs or something like that. So I was kind of kind of lost. The first but... census, uh, the first census was done seventeen ninety. So seventeen ninety. Yep. So if you're able to go to 1820 on record, I think that's actually impressive. I'm only able to go beyond that because it's down word of mouth. <laughs> okay, and I'm, I'm only the, the, yeah. I'm able to the, go the, the, to the 1700s on my father's side only because of the prolific things they did. That's the only reason why they're mentioned. That's the only my mother's side, however. That's proven to be a whole, you know, another chestnut to crack, man. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you're doing pretty good. I, I've so far on my mother's side, I've gotten back to the about maybe about eighteen, oh, about eighteen eighty. But that's that's about as far as. And I've you know I've ran into some stalls and roadblocks, but um, it's out there, bro. It's out there. You just got to keep pushing. All right, I appreciate. It. Thank you. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, bro. Dr. Fatu? Yes. You, you need a lung? Would you like for me to donate a lung for you? You know, just for the night. I, I'll give you my lung. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> you call it. We got to get you in, we, we got to get you in a uh, copper color romance. You, you'd love it there. Although, you know, if you don't have a sense of humor, you might not want to join. But no, you got to give props out the copper color <laughs> romance. Love and pettiness because we get it done in there. And for all of y'all trying to body Rooted Sky, all right, Rooted Sky got something for y'all. Y'all see she basically comes back, right? She comes back and hits hard. You got to love girlfriend Rooted Sky. Got to love that sister because y'all be just just bodying her up in there, but she always comes back swinging. Got to love a sister who can basically got some fight. But anyway, uh, oh, and shout out to Derek Americas, Chris Jr., uh, Tyrone Street, Brandon McNeil, all the cats in there, Safa, all your cats in there, y'all crazy. All of you, Kalana Bay, uh, Belinda, all of you, Karen, you're all crazy, and I love it. But anyway, we're back to the show, okay? It is three after the hour, and we are talking about the good, the bad, and ugly with DNA testing when it comes to indigenous Americans. So let's get into the bad really quick, Dr. Patu, so that people can understand what the deal is. No, 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 no. Let's take it back to the good because there's a couple okay, of points. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to the good. Yeah, let's go to the good because there's something that they have called uh, genetic communities with ancestry, and uh, this is another interesting feature. So based okay. on your DNA matches, they assign you to a genetic community. And um, let me see. Let me go up yes. there. I I took a, a picture of it. They assigned both my mom and my uh, did I. Let me see here. Go here. They assigned both my mom and my uncle to uh, North Carolina. You see it right there, that picture? That's the picture yes. that they took. Now, according to them, that's based on all their DNA matches. And, of course, people are submitting their uh, 
their family trees. And some of those trees are very, very extensive. And according to the genetic definition of uh, genetic community, these are people that you share common ancestry with, and their ancestry goes back. And I'm quoting them hundreds of years. So you see, they're saying that this is their genetic community, and it goes back hundreds of years. When did the slaves? You know, let's let's believe their story. We're from slaves. I thought we came here. After 1750, how is this hundreds? Hmm. This is this is what they're saying. Okay, right. so that's another that's a another indirect admission. Let's go back to this whole thing with the X chromosome. I was about to explain the process called introgression. Introgression. Well, it's a very complex. Uh, uh, it's very complex, but let me make it very simple. When you talk about introgression, that's basically. Uh, what has happened with so-called African Americans with these uh, foreign DNA uh, genetic intrusions, I would call like Southeast Asian, Native American, Mongoloid. Basically, you have two separate populations that are uh, genetically dissimilar. And you have a larger predominant population, that would be the Paleo-American, that we're saying that they're calling African or Sub-Saharan African. All right? That's the larger population that was here. You have a smaller population that's coming in, the invaders, the Mongoloids, the Southeast Asians, okay? There's war, there's movement, and there's intermarriage. That's just what happens, okay, all over the world. And because there's so much extensive mixing, remember, this didn't just happen over a few hundred years. We've been here for thousands of years. So this is an ancient process. What eventually happens with introgression is that the main population takes on a little bit of genetic markers from the invading group who are a smaller population. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. I was on mute. That it does. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, I thought I got disconnected. All right. No. <laughs> so that that is what's going on. And the reason why uh, that's important, because when I did my DNA test, the same markers came up. And I would not have expected the same markers to come up because my father is 100% continental African. Do you understand what I'm saying? That whatever is there should be even washed away, but it wasn't. So now what's interesting, once I did the DNA test, I started having matches with Ghanaians. And then there's something where you can click and you can see your mutual relatives. None of them had so-called African-American relatives. It was just other Ghanaians or people. There was saw another uh, young lady who's indigenous. She was half Ghanaian. She also matched to me, and she matched to the Ghanaians. But mm. the Ghanaians did not match. Now, they should, because according to the history that they feed us, many slaves came out of that region, correct? That's what they tell correct. us. And the Correct. other thing, well, the argument could be, well, maybe uh, they would be too distantly related, so therefore, you know, maybe it's not showing. Well, no, that's not true because I match to several relatives, uh, and we have a common ancestor before 1750. I actually verified that. I have a few relatives that you can see, you actually see from the test that we're genetically related. And our common ancestor is uh, before 1750, somebody who was born like 1740-something. So that's how sensitive the, the, the test can be. So why? So given that, African Americans should be matching to continental Africans who are participating in this test. Correct. Exactly. And especially a place like Ghana where according to what they keep telling us, so many people came out of there. It just does not make sense that none of them had any African-American matches except for me and to another young lady who was half Ghanaian. You understand? So that's another thing. So those are, those are clues. Then there's something called, um, let me see, there's another feature that they have, and it's called DNA Circle. Okay, that's okay. a relatively new feature as well. And that right. is basically people who match to you, uh, many who have done a family tree. 
okay, and you are matched to, let's say they do their family trees and it goes back to these, these set of individuals, these 10 individuals trace themselves to a couple from the 1700s. Well, if you're matched to X number of their descendants, they know that 70, there's a 70% chance that you are also related possibly a descendant, but 70% related to their common ancestor. So when you look at the DNA circles of my mom and also of my uncle, all those DNA circles are matched to individuals who are linked to the Saponi tribe and whose ancestor is also a Saponi. Those are other clues as well. Nobody yet is an African. So now Hmm. they're telling you you're continental African, but that all your DNA matches are with people who are here. Nobody's matching to you that's a continental African. They come out with a feature called DNA circle, a DNA circle linking you to people who have a common ancestry with some distant ancestors. They did the work. These people did the the, uh, genealogical research, found these people actually on records, okay? And you're related to several of their descendants. They include you in the circle, and they tell you, based on that, they know statistically you have a 70% chance of either being a descendant of their same ancestor or at least related to their ancestor. And those individuals are also not African but indigenous Americans because the research was already done. So now these are the things that Ancestry DNA is telling us. The only thing that they've told you up till now is you're 70-something percent sub-Saharan African. Everything else telling you you've been here hundreds of years and the people you're matched to are here. Nobody's matching to you that's an African. Ironically, the only Africans that came into it was when I participated in it. Right. Right. Up Up till then, I just assumed they weren't doing the test. They are. Hmm. And well, the other thing, they're not, they're not, and they're not showing Southeast Asian and Native American markers that are statistically significant. So, when I got my results, I ended up showing zero point five percent Southeast Asian, zero point five percent Native American, and those were statistically st- uh, significant. So I, I was surprised because I would figure with a father that's a hundred percent. Uh, Sub-Saharan African, that should be washed out. But what I learned, the process called introgression, and uh, Tyrone Lewis Cannon explained it to me. He said, no, because what has happened is those markers are so embedded with paleo-American DNA, it has become such a part of their DNA that your mother, you know, you having a a continental African father who's 100% African, it couldn't even wash that away. Wow. Do you understand? Yes. Because those markers wow. are so embedded. Even though they are small contributing uh, genetic markers, they are literally embedded as part of the paleo. They'll tell you that strip is African, but the African doesn't have those markers in it. The African-American has those genetic markers. So, you know, when you hear me constantly talking about it, yes, it almost implies that I need the Native American and the Southeast Asian to somehow or another prove that we're indigenous. No, I don't need it, but this is this is the garbage they're handing us. I'm saying as right. I'm looking at it and I'm looking at the patterns, there's a pattern here. Right. Indeed. And what the pattern is showing is that there was that we were here anciently. It's not that we have Native American DNA markers and Southeast Asian DNA markers. No, that's not the big deal. The big deal is those are tiny bands adjacent to this DNA that they're calling African. And we know, and geneticists say, when you see those patterns... See, I looked at uh, analysis by geneticists of other people where this was not even an issue of discussion. And they would tell you, if you see a long band of a particular color, that is who the person is primarily, okay? And if you see a tiny little band mixed to it, that means that is a mixture that took place long time ago between those two populations. Now, that came out of the mouth of a geneticist. Hmm. People, I hope you all are taking this in because this is some good 
good stuff. Okay, Again. so those are all features that are all consistent with a, a, a set of people that have been here long before a slave trade. This is the stuff Correct. they're telling you. This is the stuff they're telling you. The only, thing the only thing that they're telling you, they're using the word African, and then they tell you whatever, 5% Senegambian, which is, a, which is laughable because since when can a Ghanaian be distinguished from a Nigerian? I, I, you know, when these two populations have, you know, tribes have gone from one area to the next. I mean, even in Ghana, you know, those are recent constructs uh, from the Berlin Conference. Those are recent yes. constructs, those divisions. I mean, you know, each tribe, I mean, the Ghanas of Ghana who are in the Cry area, they migrated from Ile Ife, Ile Ife uh, in the 9th, 10th century. And the Cairns of Ghana migrated from the north. Uh, they only recently arrived to Ghana in the 10th century. They came out of the north. They came out of the Burkina Faso area. So how is it that you could distinguish between a Ghanaian and a Nigerian when many of the tribes that are found there migrated, some of them, especially the, through the Eastern Division, migrated out of uh, uh, Nigeria. The Aways of Ghana came out of Togo. So, you know, that's how I know that. That part is definitely crap. Right. 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 So I you. know time time is moving on. Go ahead. No, that's that's cool. That's cool. Okay. okay. How is it that we 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 don't get this? How is it that we don't see through this? Well, well why is it that we don't you would see have through to, this? Because uh, well, this took some time. Uh, oh, yes, I, I get it. This, I get it. It's going to take time. Yeah, it uh, this took time and and study and you know I learned from people who uh, still know a lot about genetics more than me. Um, uh, this also uh, was backed up because I spoke to elders. I, I was smart enough to uh, not just go to family reunions and just eat chicken. You know, I, I literally sat at the <laughs> feet. Yeah, you know, I sat at the, the feet of my elders. You know, they were born in the early 1900s before 1910, and my mother had two aunts and an uncle, and all three of them had their faculties, and I bled them to death with information, whether it was gossip, whether, you know, I just literally just talked to them until they just, there was nothing else, nothing else to tell me. And then I spoke to, uh, the oldest gentleman I spoke to was well into his 90s, and coincidentally, he passed away after I spoke to him. I was probably like around 20. He knew my great-grandfather's father, although he wasn't related right. to him. He knew my great-grandfather's father. And he, he, he right. gave me the name, the spelling, and I was able to track them down. And you ate chicken while you were doing all that. Let's not yeah, get lost course. here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course. You want to get into the bad real quick? Yeah. Well, basically the bad, um, what am I uh, talking about? Um, you know, well, if you, you know, buy into all of this and, and, you, and you fall for this crap and, uh, many of us have, and, and you end up thinking that you are an, an African. What has ended up happening? Your energies, your heart, your your desires, everything is uh, is outside of this land. You don't have interest in this land. You don't care about setting up legacies because you don't have, uh, uh, in your mind, you're not historically tied to this land. And it, it has done a lot, a lot of damage. I mean, a lot of damage. I think that contrary to so called bridging uh the 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 relationship between continental Africans and indigenous Americans, if anything, it eroded it. Uh, you know why? Because now you have inferiority complexes. Now you have a, a false sense of superiority. You have people walking around acting homeless right in their own land and then you have people here looking at you like you're homeless, you know, and, and it's it's disgusting. It's disgusting. You you uh you know, no kind of um who we are, of our differences, of whatever genetic uh predispositions uh to illnesses that we may have that has nothing to do with Africa because we do have genetic predispositions to certain illnesses and Africans right. have theirs. Okay? And uh, we're not the same people. We have uh higher rates of autoimmune diseases, lupus, yes. uh rheumatoid arthritis, um we uh, are more prone to alcoholism, okay? Yes. Um, I don't want anyone jump, uh, jumping down my throat. I do think we're a little yeah, bit more prone to bipolarism. 
Yeah, I'm well, I don't so think glad that's I'm a genetic thing, though. I don't think that's uh, a genetic thing, though. I think that was more due to them, because uh, we had already, uh, we were making liquors and stuff like that before they got here. You I know. think it's a but type I, of liquor. I think that's a culture uh, thing. Um, I do think it's, there is a genetic predisposition. I, I have so? no doubt about it. Uh, that's okay. you know, I know you know we could debate that, but I I mean I see it in my practice. It's something I, I see with liquor, how uh, alcohol has a stronghold on indigenous populations here, not just here in America, uh, Latin Americans. I I see it. It's just different. I, when I and you got to remember, I grew up between two sets of populations. Uh, continental Africans in general, they don't crave right. alcohol, and I saw that. I I could see you know let's say my mom was uh, thirteen or fifteen. And half of my uncles died from alcoholism And my mother was not an alcoholic But let's just put it this way She liked her drink And I paid attention oh, yeah. to that She liked oh, yeah. that drink And um, my my I had one aunt She was an alcoholic And the rest of them uh, they, they loved to drink And it was their intellect And the fact that they did not want to be drunkards That made them not But trust me If they wanted They could have easily done it and oh. I, 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 I saw, I, I can see the difference. Uh, definitely Trust there's me. some genetics uh, working with that uh, as well. Trust me. Um, Trust me. I, I, as somebody who, and anybody who's raised in North Carolina or in the South who knows what a liquor house is, trust me, I, I, I can, I get where you're coming from. I knew basically a large man, a preponderance of cats and, and, and ladies who were drunks in the liquor house every day. That mm-hmm. whole deal. Uh, a lot of my friends, you know, they they pretty much uh, they, you know, I can count the number of fathers that I knew who were drunk, and a lot of times, a lot of some of the mothers who were drunk, or whole families that were drunks too. Uh, and it may be genetic, but also it's a lot of it's the alcohol. Because if you go to South Africa right now, they have a huge, huge problem with alcohol, and a lot of it is that the alcohol that they were consuming before changed. Mm-hmm. They're actually starting to drink the stuff that we drink now, and they're getting hooked. So mm-hmm. that maybe have something to do with it. Mm-hmm. Autoimmune diseases we're more predisposed to. Um, yes, autoimmune we're, we're very much so. I, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, that autoimmune diseases is a, a very interesting, like um, sarcoid, lupus, um, what is it, uh, MS. MS. These are all autoimmune yes. diseases, even hypothyroidism, okay? Thyroid diseases, whether it's hyper or hypo, these are all autoimmune diseases. Now, when you really think about autoimmune, you know, it's do you do you know what autoimmune disease are? You know, I, I don't want to assume your audience knows what that is. Basically, that well, you why have don't you a tell defense. Us? Okay, you have a defense system, your immune system, and your immune system is your defense. It's like your army, and it's designed to basically fight outside offending agents, okay, whether it's viruses, colds, or whatever it is. Well, what happens uh, with autoimmune disorders, your defense system literally is tricked into turning on its own body, its own yes. organs, its own cells. So your, your defense system turns on the host, it, there's something that happens within uh, on a cellular level where it's like a war internally. Now, it, it, there hasn't been any formalized studies, but there are small studies that have studied this. And this uh, tends to happen more in miscegenated populations. Now, it's going back. It's jumping back to what I just mentioned when I was discussing the good. Okay? Populations that are genetically dissimilar, that intermix doesn't matter how tiny it is. There's intermixing. You are more right. likely to see autoimmune disorders. Continental Africans actually have low low rates of autoimmune disorders. I mean, I have one lady from Nigeria who has rheumatoid arthritis, but it is very rare. That has been studied. Um, among the Africans that tend to have autoimmune disorders, you will find they will be from the Canary Islands, ironically, where they right. have a lot of Portuguese blood. Isn't that interesting? But that is a disorder that you will see more here. You see some. You will see moderately in Europe, high among so-called African Americans and Latinos. Extremely high among Latinos. They actually have lupus and all those things a little bit more than us. But it's it's, it's significant enough with us as well. Rare with continental Africans. So that in mm. itself tells you. 
that tells you there was uh, um, intermixing that went on here in the Americas. And this had nothing to do with uh, Europeans coming in on that bloodline. We had intermixing coming in with the Asiatics coming in on us. That goes back. Right. That gives us certain predisposition as well. Uh, not understanding who we are. This is, a, again, part of the bad. Not understanding who we are. We're not studying illnesses that we're predisposed to. Okay, and that's not good because all populations have scientists that study, okay, that particular population and their predisposition, like uh, Asians, like Koreans and Chinese are predisposed to gastric cancers, okay? I mean, I mean, esophageal gastric cancers, are, I mean, it just really destroys that population. You know, so every population has their what I call weaknesses. We, we haven't studied ours because we're so busy under this umbrella of Africans, yes. and there are differences, okay? Not studying who we are, we, we are, we're not taking into account that the fact that we were matriarchal, and many of us were matrilineal. So, you know, again, speaking to the elders is not just about getting names and tracing your uh, heritage. It's also about speaking to them. And just when you speak to them, you also learn the things that they did. It's a very, it was a very common practice throughout the South for men to hand their check over to their wives. That, with, the, with the blacks, not the whites. This is common no. throughout. This was very common throughout the South. And I was speaking yes. to a friend of mine who's from, uh, her, uh, she's from St. Kitts. She said they were doing that too. That was very common. The men would go to work, come home, hand a check. And just check and over. I, you know, it work. doesn't matter yeah. whether they was from South Carolina, Louisiana. This was very, very common. As a matter of fact, one of my older patients, he's from Louisiana. He said the one time he saw his mother get so angry was when his father cashed a check before he handed it to her. She was a housewife. She never worked outside the house. That was a very right. common practice. And why was that? Because evidently the men were acclimated to the women basically making the decisions when it came to the home, you know, yes, inside. very much so. The home. The men were acclimated blunt. to that. Exactly. So yes. when you start, when you don't really understand your culture and then someone now is telling you you're African and Africans are very patriarchal and yes, you have some tribes that inherit through the women, but uh, you know, I know, uh, you know, I've, uh, some of the Afrocentrics love to talk about the Akans, particularly the Ashantis, and how the Ashanti queen mother picks the chief and all of that. But I, please don't misunderstand this. Yes, they inherit through the mother line, but they're very much male dominated. So Africans are very much male dominated. They they share that with uh, Eurasians. Europeans. They have that in common with Eurasians, okay? The, yes, with the Eurasians, only time exactly. Exactly. The only reason we're seeing a change now in uh, continental Africa is through, um, you know, sorry to say this, but it's the truth, through European influence. So now through the women becoming educated, now you're, you're starting to see a little bit of a rise up. Not a lot, a little bit of a rise up. But black women okay, so, in, Amer uh, black women in so, America actually... We 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 never needed that. We never needed. No, never uh, did. Never did. We we never, never did. needed that because as a subculture, I mean, my great great aunt. Now this is my grandmother's aunt. She was born 1883. She owned land, and she actually kept that land from being lost and taken and swindled by by the white man. Okay, she owned land. Lived in her own house. She was married and she was widowed. Okay. You know, when when did white women ever have that kind of control? When did the African they never women did. ever have that kind of control? Yeah, they, they never did, they and never our, did our either. people were acclimated to that in the South. You understand? Yes. That was just very, very common. My great-grandmother, you know, I spoke about this before. She was a healer. You know, they were used to the women basically uh, uh, having a lot of say-so, and they, the men were comfortable with that. But if now you... Um, are told you're African, and now you're coming in contact with continental Africans, and their whole vibe is different, their whole soul is different, and you see the women are subdued, okay? Now you're looking at your woman, and you're like, okay, now her mouth is big. And so you start hearing theories, okay, well, y'all got big mouths because, you know, we were oppressed as a man, and that's why y'all became more dominant. And no, and then that, that had nothing to do with that. We were comfortable right. in our expression, and 
the men were comfortable with us expressing ourselves because we, you see, and this is what happens when you don't study who you are and that becomes hidden under a blanket of African. And it's been bad also for our relationship with continental Africans because now they're walking around with a false sense of, oh, these people look at them, they're lost because we act like we're lost. Okay, you know, and and you're behaving like you're lost, you're you're running over there, you know, and then they act like they need to teach us, and they don't need to teach us anything, we're an ancient people, okay, there's nothing they need to teach us, you know, we're we're two separate people, uh, in two separate histories, and uh, it becomes a paternalistic type of vibe, all right, so uh, it definitely hasn't been good for our relationship with them. The other thing, too, on that note, I, I never felt like, we had to get along with Africans. You know, and this, go, this is coming from me. Even though my father's continental Africa, I never felt like there had to be this whole kumbaya between us. I just never felt like that. Uh, we're two separate people. I tried. Even before, I know you did, and very hard. Yes, I did. Very, yeah. very, very, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we, you know, we're two separate. We're two separate people, and the reason why I, I kind of always felt like that because uh, continental Africans, as you know, and many of your audience knows, they're tribal, so they don't get yes. along themselves. So I just always felt like that was not realistic, especially even believing that we were descendants of them at the time. I just felt like we've been here long enough and become unique enough unto ourselves that it just wasn't realistic. Well. Now, knowing that we are indigenous, even less so. I mean, why do we owe it to continental Africans to get along with them any more than we are to get along with people from Papua New Guinea or any other indigenous community around? We're all indigenous to the planet, okay? Yes. And, and yes, it, I, and I, I think that uh, we need to all respect that and respect our separate spaces. Um, somehow or another, I still keep picking up with many of our people. So many of our people who actually know this still have to throw in this word African. It's very hard for them to let that go. I'm not sure why, but they really need to let it go because this is not about your great, 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 great grandfather who may have been that one uh, of that small percentage that just happened to come out of the Senegambia region. You don't define yourself by uh, exter- uh, ancestor like that. You define yourself by the culture that predominates and that nurtures you. And we come out of the womb of the indigenous American woman. We come out of the womb. We are nurtured by that culture. So this is, uh, you know, this whole percentage thing, that's ridiculous because you're not claiming yes. Ireland. You're not claiming no. Scotland. And that's in your DNA as well. So you're, you're, you're uh, an indigenous person nurtured or Irish. by... Well, yeah, we're not claiming none of that. Um, so... You know that that's basically the bad, okay? Yeah, and, now, if, and if you lived in if you lived in the Northeast, Dutch. Yes. Because there's a lot of Dutch ancestry in, uh, among us uh, Negro Indians who were, um, you know, living New York area particularly because you know uh, New mm-hmm. York, New Jersey, Connecticut, that's Dutch territory. So mm-hmm. yeah, you're right. You're yeah. absolutely right about that. Yeah. And if you live in Florida, Spanish. Just saying. Yes. Just saying. We got uh, we got about 27 minutes left in the show. Again, we're with Dr. Patu. She's our guest, and she is tearing it up right now, people. My mind has been blown about five times, and I have I am not under the influence of any pharmaceutical drugs. All right, alcohol. Doctor Two, I'm not in the force of alcohol or mm-hmm. anything else until after the show. So, <laughs> but, you know, feel free to call into the show five six three nine 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 three four four two is the number to dial. Press one if you have a question or comment. Uh, and again, we're getting into the whole DNA thing, the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to us. Okay, we got about twenty six minutes. Let's talk about the bad for a quick minute their doctor too so that people will understand the bad part of it since you know like your boy that's what he went straight to let's talk oh you oh you mean not the bad we just finished talking about the bad because the okay. bad basically okay. well, was not knowing who we are and and the confusion and the nonsense and not studying ourselves and all of that what that what's led well, to that a little bit i want to talk about there. the ugly 
we want to okay, talk yeah, about okay, the ugly. Let's talk, yeah, I meant the ugly. I'm, I'm so sorry. I meant the ugly. All right. Okay, we're, real quick, before we get into that, though, we got a call on the line. 518, mm-hmm. 518, you're on the Rich Report. What's up? Hey, how you doing, guys? Hey, what's going on, bro? Doing good, doing good. Um, This is Damon Taylor right here, just giving you a call. Try to, hey, what's um, going on, actually, Damon? Doing good, doing good. I just wanted to build on what um Fatu had mentioned about, um, like, seeing the disconnect between the two cultures, you know, between the African yes. culture and the uh, American culture. You know, I tell a lot of people, you know, my sister, her father's from Sierra Leone. And, you know, growing up, you know, I grew up a lot in that culture, and there was a lot of distinctions, you know. And one particular thing, you know, I mentioned, like, her name, her name is um Na- is Nakasa, N-A-K-A-S-S-A, right? And that name right. itself, it means uh, between two worlds. So I always, you know, in a lot of discussions, especially with people who kind of want to insist that we are the same, I say, like, why would they want to name her Nakasa and name it between two worlds? You know what I'm saying? If they consider us the same, if we are considered the same or just like an extension of, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't think that right they on. would go and choose being from Sierra Leone and having that knowledge of Africa that they would go and name her that. You know, that's just a, um, something that I always thought of. And when, when Fatu mentioned, when Dr. Fatu mentioned that, then I kind of, you know, it kind of struck that um, chord in me. Right on. Right on. Dr. Fatu? Yes. You know, real, yeah, real I mean, quick, real quick, real quick. My mm-hmm. my uh, my sister, my my daughter's sister, right? Is mm-hmm. uh, her father is also he's West African, and of course, mm-hmm. obviously, her mom is is uh, indigenous. And right. the distinction that they play between the two of them, right? You know, my daughter takes in their minds takes a second seat to her sister because they consider her real African. Mm-hmm. Where's the father? Well, I'm just curious. Where's the father from? Nigeria. Okay. That is because of how they inherit. You see, you know, and I told this to you uh, privately, Gabe. My father is Ghanaian, and uh, yes. he's he's Kwau, uh, which is a part of the Akan people. They inherit matrilineal. So I was right. always raised uh, by my dad that I am my mother. I am not him. You know, that that is how they inherit. They don't walk around and say, oh, I'm half Awe, I'm half Ashanti. They don't do that. You are what your mother is, according to my father's line of inheritance. So because I was raised that way, and of course my last name is his last name, and it's a foreign last name, I would often get asked, where are you from? So I would say, mm-hmm. I'm from here. You know, and so what are you? I'm like, I'm I'm American. And they say, and your mom? I'm like, my mom is from here. She's from North Carolina. And your dad, and then I would say my dad is Ghanaian. So now what I've noticed over the years, Ghanaians will say, oh, okay, okay. And they they may ask me, you know, most of them ask me what part of Ghana, you know, because they want to know what area and stuff. Uh, When I encounter Nigerians, Senegalese, Guineans, other uh, continental Africans, they would say, why aren't you saying you're Ghanaian? Your dad is one. And it took me a little bit to get that. And the reason why they do that is because they inherit from their fathers. You are what your father is. Right. They 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 don't look at it the way Ghanaians. Now, when Ghanaians meet me, there's a sort of auto rejection. All right. There's an auto mm. rejection when they see me next to my mother because they inherit mm. through their. It is a very matrilineal. Even though the Aways are patrilineal, the Gans are patrilineal. The Akans, who are about 50% of the population, dominate Ghana culturally. So even though these other individual tribes, uh, who are smaller, inherit through their fathers, they they have a there's a, a canonization I call it of Ghana. Ghanaians know what I'm talking about. So they when they see my, me with my mom, my mom used to work with me in the office. She was my uh, secretary. There's a there's an auto rejection. I grew up like that. There's an auto rejection. It doesn't mean they're necessarily rude. They automatically link me with my mother. They don't see me like I'm one of them. And I was raised yeah. like that. My how my father. That is how they in they inherit. 
You know, I have a half sister, uh, my father's oldest daughter. Her mother's a way. My father does not consider her part of his group. She is a way. She mm. considers herself a way. That's how she identifies herself. She doesn't walk around and say I'm half this. So that is my explanation. It's discriminatory, but they don't. That that uh, sister of your daughter, they yes. identify her with her father. And that is why, because those tribes inherit through their dads. And that is why I would get that sort of question, like, oh, you don't, you're not proud of Ghanaian, being a Ghanaian? You know, like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You know, and that's because they're imposing their lines of inheritance on me. And I, and I learned right. that's where that was coming from. Right. Well, actually, mm-hmm. it's the indigenous no. side that, that consider, considers her, uh, let's see, her grandmother is a was a African American studies deal, all the civil rights movement and all this other stuff, the whole back to Africa and all this. Mm-hmm. So they're big on that, uh, in on that side of the family now. So her having African blood means that she's more real than say my daughter who is indigenous, you know, See, Cherokee and, that's, that's, and that's black. That's part looking. of that bad stuff. That's part of that right. bad stuff. That's, a that's total part negation of, of your own roots. It, the total yeah, dismissal of the ancientness of, of, of your people and putting yourself underneath a whole other group of people in your own land. And that's, right. this is where that snottiness and snootiness comes from, you know, that turning up of your nose. Like, again, I call it the syndrome of thinking we're throwaway bastard children of them, you know. So, you know, that, that is exactly where that's coming from. And that has to, that right has to be stopped. Okay. Agree. Agree. Damon, what's what's on your yeah. mind, bro? Um, I mean, also to add on to that, it's kind of yes. what she's saying, which is like it's far f- for the future generations. Not really, you know, kind of build it off of to what Red Tail has said earlier. You know, like that thinking that it's not important, but it is important because if we don't leave that legacy for our children to follow, then eventually it'll be like dinosaurs. It'll be just completely laid to waste, you know what I'm saying? So we got to make sure that we continue to push and teach, you know what I mean? And that's why I appreciate what you guys are doing today, you know, and actually not just today, but in general, just so that we can continue to teach because not for us, not for our egos, you know, that might be fine for a moment, but um, it's really for the future, for the future generations of our children, you know? True indeed. True indeed, bro. I appreciate you calling in as always, and you guys should check out Damon on 4A. He lays it down. He puts some really... Great historical facts up that you guys should check out. So please do that. All right. Um, for two. Yes. Okay. So what have you noticed? Okay. We, we're in the ugly part. We're in the ugly side of it now. Oh, it's yes. Real I want to definitely deal with Go this ahead. because uh, it, it needs to be dealt with. Okay. Yes. Number one, uh, not a, many of us, and this is a growing a growing movement, a lot of people are becoming more and more aware that we're indigenous. I mean, this is growing, okay? I speak to my brother since I'm in Georgia, okay? And this has become, he told me this information is spreading, okay? So it's even reaching uh, and it's influencing the Pan-Africanists because the information is overwhelming and you can't debate it. Like I've told, uh, you know, like you and I always say all the time, if you just study American history, they indirectly tell you you're indigenous. If you It'll actually, tell you, yeah. It'll tell you, study, yeah. just study it. So we know all of this. So here's the ugly truth. Now that, you know, I've done my, uh, and I'm going to use myself as an example because it really applies to any one of us if you're able to go back and your family line. So I end up learning the names of the surnames that are associated with the tribes. My mom is from okay. Eastern North Carolina. You, you know that, yes. Gabe. So they're yes. from the same area as, as you. And uh, there's certain names associated with certain tribes, like, you know, certain names associated with the Lumbees, the Mahavans. And you yes. become familiar with those surnames, okay? And I became familiar with those surnames. And those, that's actually very important if you're doing this kind of research. Um, and uh, I uh, went back in the records. I ended up learning uh, some of the surnames of my free forefathers, okay? Ended up learning that if you were a free person of color, you were automatically associated with a, a tribe. I learned that also from a number of people, including a North Carolina historical researcher. She's an elderly woman right now uh, who's retired, but uh, she told me that as well, and she's very familiar with the names. So um, by our, the DNA, let me, I'm going to go back to that just a little bit, okay, because it kind of uncovers this ugliness. You know, up until uh, before DNA testing, Okay, there was a, a mystery for those of us that called ourselves African-Americans in terms of how we saw the so-called Indians 
who lived maybe a county from us. Like, okay, in eastern North Carolina, you have people like the Mahavans. You know, you have up in Virginia the Chickahominis. You know, you have those tribes, the Saponis. Um, and, Gabe, you're familiar with them, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, before this information became available, uh, people had a tendency to see them as separate people. And that's how they liked it. They were Indians and we were black. Okay, and that's how they've walked around. Okay, and some of them still walk around. But guess what? The truth is being peeled back. And when the DNA tests uh, now come out, guess what? Those same people who are walking around, many of them lighter than many of us, uh, yes. who are saying that they're Indians, state recognized, having these powwows, you know, as if they're a separate population from us, even though they're in the yes. same counties as us. The DNA yep. test is showing that you're, relate, you're related to them. Well, guess who's popping up related to my uncle and my mom? People in the Mahara Nation. People in the Saponi Nation. Eastern North Carolina, I'm not surprised by that. By this slide. Okay, see, we, um, shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised. But see, the no. DNA is confirming that. And now I'm looking at their results. Well, how, how are you? You have the same genetic breakdown as me. The only thing is you're more European. You know, yes. so what is what is this claim? What what is going on? And then when you start doing research, you start learning that they are not any more indigenous. In fact, in theory, the darker ones, the browner ones, are actually genetically more indigenous than them. The reason yes. they have a a claim to it is because they descend from free people of color. And for those of right. you who want to have uh, who want to do some more extra reading on that, you could Google uh, or look up Paul Heinig, H E I N E G G. He is Caucasian. He's married to a black woman, but he's done a lot of uh, research and genealogical uh, research on these free people of color, the different families. It is a useful, uh, uh, a, a useful uh, source to have, and he traces them back. Now, of course, he's not going to say the men are indigenous. He's saying that these were really African-American men, and oftentimes they were married to Caucasian women. And that also happened in my family. When I traced it, there was a branch where the woman was a Quaker, and she married a Chickahominy man, and they moved into Hertford County, which had a large Quaker uh, community at the time, a population. And, uh, and that happened a lot. That happened with a lot of those families. So matrilinear, uh, matrilineally, some of them descend from Caucasian women. Not all of them, but some of them right. do, believe it true. or not. And, no, um, no, true. Yeah, and and a lot of and and they were able to uh, confer free statuses to their children because remember, being slave and free was uh, a status passed down through the woman. Okay, so a lot of them were free because their mothers were white, their grandmothers right. were white. Okay, right. all right. So we need to understand that. So there, so the the DNA has also uncovered hidden truth that your relatives are these same people one county over or in the same county who up to this point you thought was a separate set of people. And they sort of promote that because all of them have this certain type of mulatto, Lena Hornish type of look, okay? And the reason why that's happening is because they practice elitism. Not all of them, and I have exactly. to say this, the Nataways do not do this. I have a number of cousins who belong. They are members to the Nataways. They, they they do not practice colorism. They they you know they just look like the rest of us. Okay. So the Nataways are pretty organ- open about their history, though. They're they're pretty open about their history and the the uh, the presence of Europeans being there the whole nine. A lot of us we tend to a lot of them say like the the um, the Lumbi here, right? Okay. And I'm going to get. I'm going to do a show on this uh, later. But say Pembroke State University or Pembroke University here, that was founded basically to teach the Lumbee, right? To educate the Lumbee, to basically take them from Lumbee status to Negro status. If you go and you find the pictures of during that time, all those Lumbees looked like you and me. They didn't look like the Lumbee that are out here today, who a lot of them now are Mongoloid, you know, or Mongoloid uh, descent. Right, those are not the same Lumbee, and the reason why is because the Lumbee Nation, as it's known now, although it's state recognized, it is not federally recognized, which means they are not getting that federal money, and 
They won't get it until they basically issue every uh, indigenous uh, person of Lumbee descent. And they're all still around in eastern North Carolina. They just won't call themselves Lumbee anymore because uh, once upon a time with their grandparents and the whole time, it was hazardous for their health to do so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the yeah, colorism so, thing is there. Oh, the colorism. And you have, to, again, what has happened, uh, well, I visited uh, in the process of doing my uh, family research, I uh, made a couple of friends from that area, a husky. Right. And we know that we're distantly related. Uh, they have the same surnames as my great great grandfather. I mean, and they shared a few things. I mean, and if you see them, again, you know, they're mulattoes. All right. And the one that was browner mm-hmm. was complaining of the colorism. Uh, and right. she, she still, by my definition, was a mulatto, by my definition. And um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, these families, because they were free families and they owned land, they intermarried with one another. They didn't want to lose land. There was classism as well uh, that existed. So they basically are continuing the same thing, you know, the same families. So you get into these tribes also through, you know, which family you come from. You know, if you're one of those prominent families from the area, and in addition to a type of kind of complexion and uh, hair texture, that, that's what's being practiced. They, uh, I, I happen to know when I visited, to show you how the, the uh, family lines link in, when I uh, stopped over to visit her when I was in North Carolina, and, you know, I had to go to the ladies' room, and when I was on my way out, she stopped me in her living room, and she mm. wanted me to, you know, see pictures. So she was showing me pictures of her daughter and different family members and a brother that passed away. And then she right. showed me a picture at a powwow of a young man. He looked uh, like a mestizo Latino. And she said, you know what, this boy here would be your relative. And I said, really? She goes, yeah, because he descends from a um, such and such, such and such person. And that that would be uh, my great great grandfather's brother, so that that young boy uh, comes off of that line. Now, a lot of his descendants are part of their group, okay? Right. You know, at, but there's always a gatekeeper. And she was telling me that uh, she now left them and joined the Chaminark Nation because they there was infighting. And, and I asked her what was it about, and there was infighting because I and I put the picture not so much uh, on your your wall, not on your uh, thread, but in my article there's a picture, there's a painting, a drawing rather of a woman called yes. Sally Lewis. Okay, yes. that yes, that caused a lot of uh, upheaval among the Meherans, because there was a family that wanted to claim that if you were not a descendant of uh, Sally Lewis, you were not a real Meheran. And uh, the rest of them went bonkers and said, you know, that's nothing but garbage. You know, we don't have to descend all from one woman, you know. And, and, uh, you know, these are the kind of things that are going on. There's a lot of elitism, a lot, you know, you got to know somebody. So just to test it out, I'm not interested in becoming a member, okay, but just to test it out, because I know what I'm looking at. I have eyes, and I'm not colorblind, okay. I, I uh, asked for, you know, a strategic person. You know, I don't want to call names. I don't want anybody coming after me for slander. But, uh, you know, I'll put a, posi- a person of position, yeah, exactly, you know. I, uh, you know, a person of <laughs> position. That's uh, that's all I will say. And um, I basically identify who I was and who I was a descendant of. Now, I was told by a member who is a, a distant relative of me, another member, that, oh, no, you definitely need to be a member because that ancestor of mine actually is sort of on their website because if you go to their website, they document the sun-dried persons of color. He was a sun-dried person of color. Basically, it was a group of men that drafted a petition against the North Carolina General Assembly in 1822, okay, because uh, it had to do with the fact that North Carolina stated that uh, slaves could be viable witnesses against free men of color, and they knew that was just nothing but an attempt to gain witnesses against them to take their land, that a slave would say whatever yes. his master would say. So they drafted exactly. a petition. They called it the Sun-Dried Persons of Color, and my uh, great-great-great-grandfather, his name was David Melton. He was born 1795. Okay, he signed that. And that is actually 
documented, and they are proud of that history. They call them proud Meheran men, all right? Now, I said that's who I am a descendant of, and I happen to know his descendants are in those in that tribe, okay? And uh, she said, oh, I haven't heard of him. Let me speak to my mother about it to see if she knows. I'm not, I, and then she, I'll get back to you in two days. And she did. I mean, she wasn't rude, but she basically said, well, no, we don't, we don't. She said she doesn't know that family. And I said, okay, thank you very much. Click. All right. And th- those are gatekeepers. Those are yeah. gatekeepers. I'm not part of that clique. You know, I might be a very, uh, you know, I'm a distant uh, descendant, but I don't come from the holes. And, I, you know, I recognized what was going on. They want to just keep it in the family. They are really doing what those their ancestors did. Yes. They just they're calling it. They are they are now a uh, state-recognized tribe. Well, the reason why I call it the ugly truth is because, believe it or not, that adds to our people's confusion. That adds to our people's confusion because now when you look at them, they they are promoting that uh, indigenous people had this type of look. They had a type of yellow skin, and they had this loose type of hair. And you know what? One of the ladies admitted to me that there was a time that the church in the area didn't let you become a member if you didn't pass the comb test. That means that a comb yes. had to be yanked through your hair, and if it stopped, you had kinks. Okay, you, you, you had weren't kinks coming and in. You couldn't be a part of it. That's right. Exactly. That and has nothing to do with being indigenous. That's colorism, and that is what they practice. So, what prompted me to add that to the write-up was this past week I saw a patient of mine, and she comes to me for her, you know asthma. You know, uh, she's uh, in her early forties. So she told me about a year and a half ago that uh, her family has done extensive. Uh, um, genealogical research and her her people on her father's side belong to the Wampanoag Nation. Okay? And I uh, you know of course you're now, you know about. Exactly. Wampanoag right. Nation. So, you know, she would sometimes come in with her, her kids and her, you know, her husband if he's, you know, willing to wait or, you know, whatever. So I you know, I, I'm familiar with her family. And so she came like maybe a couple of months after that and I said, So, you know, did you go up there? Did you, you know, you should definitely get involved. You know, I'm all excited. And I kind of noticed she was lackluster. And every time she would come to the office, I would bring it up, and it was kind of a lackluster type of response. And I would think to myself, right. well, why find out this kind of information just to say it if you're not going to sort of get involved with it? So it just happened she was my last patient a couple of days ago, and I asked her about this. And I said, you know, um, you brought it up to me, but you – you uh what are you? What is your involvement with this? And then she, you know, I guess, you know, it was time, you know, she had time to speak and uh, no one else was there. She basically expressed to me that uh, she did look into it, contrary to what I may be thinking, and she was turned off. And, and I said, why? And she went on to say that basically, you know, again, I don't want to, you know, the world is small, but a fraction, because they are, again, a lot of infighting. There's a fraction of them, okay, and a key person uh, who she is related to, okay? They share, like, the same. It's like their great-great-grandparents are siblings. Told her she did not qualify because she is related to him on the side that's not Wampanoag, okay? Hmm. (laughs) And uh, told her that also because a fourth great-grandparent is white, uh, which is just about everybody, okay, uh, whether you know it or not, uh, she also didn't qualify, even though majority of them uh, look mulatto. Yes, there's some dark ones among them, some dark ones among the tribes. There was always a dark one that gets in through poly- political, maybe they're a grandchild of, a, you, know, you understand, that's how those darker ones get in. I'm, I'm, I'm telling right. you, that's how they get in. Okay. They're, they're a grandchild we, got, we got about of, two minutes left. We got about two minutes oh, left for two, so go ahead. Oh, okay, so make a long story short, she wasn't uh, allowed to become a member. Uh, she also found that there was some discussion, even though they don't use DNA to qualify you to come in. You know, it was like a comparison of how much Native American do you have. It turns out she has 3%, and, and, you know, others were saying, well, I have a little bit of more. And what she picked up was that same type of elitism. There is elitism with them as well, you know, um, if you don't belong to a certain family certain class level, there's a blocking and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, basically my point is I'm not telling people 
I, I see a lot of focus on, you know, the nonsense continental Africans say, and I'm not saying people shouldn't express their frustration. We have these private groups, and people need to be uh, feel comfortable to express whatever conflicts that they have with continental Africans. But honestly, don't put your energy on continental Africans. If they disrespect you, set them straight. You know who you are. But don't put your energy on that. I'm actually more concerned about these people who have the title, uh, who have the titles of our ancestors. These people are walking around with our ancestral names, Maharans, Chaminocks. These are the same yeah. tribes we're coming off of, and they're walking us. around acting like they're walking around, uh, uh, basically putting on a facade as if our people always looked like how they looked when they right. are nothing but models from us. Claiming they're claiming acting to be like, us. Acting like we are the Africans and they are the Indians. That's the crap that exactly. they are promoting. And let me tell you something, even though DNA was designed to uh, create, make us and connect us to Africa, it was done to keep us confused. DNA has uncovered the lid off of them because we are matching to them. Right. And they are not showing this so-called Native American DNA. They're showing the right. same genetic markers as us, except the difference is they have more Euro blood. That is why they right look on. like that. Not because right so that is that is the ugly truth. And I think as more and more of us learn this truth, we need to deal with those tribes who are walking around uh looking looking like this and they are deliberately uh intermingling among themselves to look like that, promoting somehow or another that is how an Indian looks. When that is and it's not. Euro and exactly. mixture that has them looking like that and a blocking of ones who legitimately descend from those tribes, but blocking them because they are not part of the families that they want to keep intermarrying with and they don't have a certain shade. That's the Agreed. ugly truth. Okay. Agreed. In short, in short, uh, we got bigger fish to fry rather than dealing with Africans who pretty much don't like us, who are insignificant in number to us anyway. Uh, these tribes, they're pretty much they're stealing our legacy, our history. That's what she's yes, that's saying. What I'm saying. And I, yes, and I, I, I fully agree. Okay, people, we're going to be back Western next tribes. week. These are not Western no, tribes. These are the tribes we come from. Exactly, exactly. Right. So we're going to be back next week. I want to thank you so much, so much, Dr. Patu, and I, I hope that you will come back on and we can really explore this more and other subjects. And we'll be back next week. We're going to have a great show. So thank you so much. Thank everybody for tuning in. I appreciate it. And as always, we'll be back next week. Peace. Put a new face on an old kitchen. The Home Depot's cabinet experts can reface your kitchen cabinets for a mini makeover in a fraction of the time and cost of new cabinets. Our licensed local experts can get the job done right, right away. So don't face another year in an outdated kitchen. Try refacing it only at the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. To learn more, visit homedepot.com slash refacing. License numbers available at homedepot.com slash license numbers.